Good morning, friends. Good morning. Welcome to worship this Sunday morning as we gather together to hear God's word and to gather around his precious and life-giving sacrament. <clears throat> it's a joy to be together this morning, and today we begin our summer schedule. That doesn't feel too different for 8.30 church, um, but it's a joy to be together nonetheless. We also begin a new setting this day, uh, so you'll notice that we now have green pamphlets in front of us instead of golden ones. Uh, and so that marks uh, a new season, a new time in the church year together. It's also a joy today to gather on Trinity <coughs> Sunday, the birthday of our congregation. Does anybody know how old Trinity is today? 255. So you can just see that probably right at the top of your bulletin, too. Um, <coughs> but today is the birthday of our congregation and uh, a holy day in the life of the church, and it's a blessing to be together. As we come forward for communion, all baptized Christians believing Christ present in the sacrament are more than welcome to communion. And so friends, as we begin our worship together this day, I invite you now to rise for confession and absolution as it's printed in the green canvas. We are here gathered in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the aid of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And friends, let us now confess our sin in the presence of God and in the presence of one another. We pray together. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake our God forgives us all our sin. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all of your sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you now to join in the singing of our gathering hymn, hymn number 414 in the Red Hymn.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace let us pray to the Lord. foundation of the universe and the beginning of time, you are the triune God, author of creation, eternal word of salvation, life-giving spirit of wisdom. Guide us to all truth by your spirit, that we may proclaim all that Christ has revealed and rejoice in the glory that he shares with us. Glory and praise to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from Isaiah. On the third day, Laban was told that Jacob had fled. So he took his kinsfolk with him and pursued him for seven days until he caught up with him in the hill country of Gilead. But God came to Laban the Aramean in the dream of by night and said to him, Take heed that you say not a word to Jacob, either good or bad. Laban overtook Jacob. Now Jacob had pitched his tent in the hill country and Laban with his kinfolk camped in the hill country of Gilead. Laban said to Jacob, What have you done? 
you have deceived me and carried away my daughters like captives of the sword. Why did you flee secretly and deceive me and not tell me? I would have sent you away with mirth and songs, with tambourine and lyre. And why did you not permit me to kiss my sons and my daughters farewell? What you have done is foolish. It is in my power to do you harm. But the God of your father spoke to me last night, saying, Take heed that you speak to Jacob neither good nor bad. Even though you had had to go because you longed greatly for your father's house, why did you steal my gods? Jacob answered Laban, Because I was afraid, for I thought you would take your daughters from me by force. Anyone with whom you find your God shall not live. In the presence of our kinsfolk, point out what I have that is yours and take it. Now Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen the gods. So Laban went into Jacob's tent and into Leah's tent and into the tent of the two maids, but he did not find them. And he went out of Leah's tent and entered Rachel's. Now Rachel had taken the house of gods and put them in a camel's saddle and sat on them. Laban felt about in the tent, but did not find them. And she said to her father, Let not my lord be angry that I cannot rise before you, for the way of women is upon me. So he searched, but did not find the household gods. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Romans. Brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If in fact we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. according to St. John, the third chapter. Glory to you, Lord. 
Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I have said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe it if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the servant, serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Good morning, friends. Good morning. Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. Amen. I am the youngest of three brothers, and I have no sisters. So in my house, growing up, everything had to do with boys. We had action figures and digging machines and all kinds of stuff that appealed to boys. And as I moved into my teenage years, while my friend groups had girls in them, I was often too distracted with my buddies as we tried to tackle and smash each other into oblivion. So when the day came that Emily and I got married, and eventually we had hope, it was a pretty big learning curve for me being an adult and now trying to cater to and care for women. Over the past 13 years of my marriage to Emily, I have learned quite a bit about some of the different realities for men versus realities for women. One of these great learning moments came when doing laundry for our family. When I do the laundry, I like to check the pockets for tissues and pens and other things that make a mess when they're permitted to go into the washer. And in doing this, I have learned that a great deal of women's clothing doesn't actually have real pockets. You look at a pair of pants, and you think that you're looking at a pocket, but then you go to check that pocket for contents, and it's sewn shut. It isn't a pocket at all. It's just a decoration made to look like one, but with no functional value. And I admit that this really bothers me. It seems to me an incredible injustice to make women's clothing that cannot hold or carry anything at all. <coughs> And then I've learned that even though the pockets are fake, and even though men's pants seem to have way more material comfort and functionality, you actually pay more for women's pants. There have been times where Emily has asked me to carry her phone, and I told her to put the phone in her own pocket, and then I found out it was a fake pocket, so I had to carry things for both of us. And while I know that this is perhaps a bit silly, for me, when I see something and I think I know what it is, and then I find out that it's all fake, and it's not at all what I thought it was, that's a letdown, that's a disappointment. As our Wednesday Bible study wrapped up this year, we spent our final time together going through Genesis chapter 31. 
In this chapter, Jacob finally decides to flee from his father-in-law, Laban. Laban, who has been taking advantage of him. So he gathers his family and all that he has, and he takes off towards the land of his birth, the land that God had promised to Abraham and all of his descendants. And as he does, we hear that Rachel, his wife, decides to steal her father's household gods. These would have likely been little carved wooden figures that represented ancestral deities. And Rachel takes them from her father's house, and she brings them along in her flight to the promised land. As Rachel and Leah's father, Laban, finds out about this, he pursues Jacob hotly until he catches up to him. But before he actually encounters Jacob, God comes to Laban in a dream and warns him sternly not to interfere with what Jacob is doing. Laban may talk to him, but he had better dare not threaten, harm, bribe, or do anything to prevent Jacob from journeying back to the land of his birth. When Laban talks to Jacob, he makes a big scene as he looks for his own household gods which have been stolen. But he doesn't find them because Rachel is sitting on top of them as she sits on her camel. Additionally, the way of woman is upon her and she's not able to get up. Ultimately, Laban, having rifled through Jacob's stuff and making accusations without being able to produce any proof at all, he winds up looking a bit foolish and shameful. Finally, he makes peace and he heads home. <clears throat> Now, while there's a lot to talk about in this story, and there's a lot of questionable and debatable decision-making, we do get a clear image of both the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the household gods of Laban. We see the contrast between two different deities. Both are revered and worshipped by their respected people. Both are called God, and both are looked to for help and strength and guidance. And yet the wooden gods of Laban turn out to be fake. They're just little wooden statues. They do not have the power to help Laban. They do not even have the power to protect themselves from being stolen and sat upon and even bled upon. On the other hand, the God of Jacob turns out to be the real thing. He has the power to bless and prosper Jacob even when he's in a foreign land and even when he's working for a father-in-law who seeks to exploit and take advantage of him at every turn. The God of Jacob has the power to guide him into new and fruitful days in a land of promise and prosperity. And the God of Jacob has the power to influence even those who do not worship him. He speaks to Laban and he draws a line which Laban simply cannot cross. In doing so, God protects and safeguards Jacob so that he might make it safely home and so that the children of Abraham might continue to multiply like the sands on the seashore. Today, as we gather together on Trinity Sunday, we rejoice as our congregation celebrates its 255th birthday. This is the oldest Lutheran church in the region, the mother church of many congregations around. This congregation gathered in worship of Christ before this county was established or before this country was formed. As members of this congregation, we know well what it means to be a part of something bigger and something older than ourselves. And as we gather together today, we continue in the custom of this congregation and many other Christians throughout history in reciting together the third and lesser known of the church's three great creeds. In a few moments, we'll share together in the Athanasian Creed. This creed has been spoken by Christians since the 500s, and it has, with the Apostles and Nicene Creeds, served to unify Western Christianity throughout that time. Within it, there are certain phrases which seem quite stern and harsh, but the reason for this is that this creed seeks to connect us with the triune God who is real and true and has power to save this broken world. Historically, there have been a lot of misunderstandings about who Jesus and the other members of the Trinity are, which has led to some terrible proclamations and practices of faith. Some have talked of Jesus as only being a mere man with no divinity at all, but that ultimately led to the question of how he would have the power to save us. Some have spoken of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as being just masks which God puts on as he interacts with us at different times. But this ultimately makes God seem rather conflicted and deceptive. Some have talked of the Son and the Holy Spirit as being created beings much like us. But this ultimately leaves them closer to us than to God, and it inevitably leads to questions about their divine power and ability to challenge sin and brokenness in this world. This creed speaks carefully of the triune God who is eternally Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It helps us to speak distinctly and truly about each person of the Trinity. 
The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit, and the Spirit is not the Father. It also helps us to see the divinity in each person of the Trinity. The Son is God, the Father is God, the Holy Spirit is God. And yet it protects us from drifting into the worship of more than one God. There is only one God. <clears throat> Friends, the Athanasian Creed gives us words to speak of a mystery that we cannot fully understand. It helps us to draw close to the God of our life and salvation. The Athanasian Creed helps us to make sure that we don't call something a pocket only to find out it's just decorative stitching that can't hold anything at all. The Athanasian Creed seeks to ensure that when we speak of God, we're not actually talking about a little wooden figure made by our own hands, a false God that will not and cannot be there for us at the end of the day. It serves as a gift from those who have gone before us to help us understand God rightly, or at least as much so as we can in this life. Because this creed, with all of its sternness, ultimately desires nothing but life for us and for all of our neighbors. The Athanasian Creed seeks to connect us with what is real and true in this world. It desires to help us in worshiping the triune God who has made us and sustained us and given us life and salvation. So today, may we give thanks for the joy of 255 years as the body of Christ in this community. May we give thanks for all of the people of God who have gone before us and whose faithful work has shared with us a great many gifts and understandings. And may we give thanks for the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who has revealed himself to us. And may we pray that in our worship we might perpetually marvel at the mystery of our God, that we might delight in the truth of his words, and that we might live with confidence in the salvation that we find only in him. Amen. Friends, at this time we rise and we join in a responsive reading of the Athanasian Creed, as you can find printed in your bulletins, in the white bulletins. Whoever wants to be saved should above all cling to the Catholic faith. Whoever does not guard it whole and inviolable will doubtless perish eternally. Now this is the Catholic faith. We worship one God in Trinity, and Trinity in unity. Neither Christ in person or divine, the divine being. For the Father is one person, the Son is another, and the Spirit is still another. But the deity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is one, equal in glory, co-eternal in majesty. What is Father is, the Son is, and so is the Holy Spirit. Uncreated is the Father, uncreated is the Son, uncreated is the Spirit. The Father is infinite, the Son is infinite, the Holy Spirit is infinite. Eternal is the Father, eternal is the Son, eternal is the Spirit. And yet there are not three eternal beings, but one who is eternal, as there are not three uncreated and unlimited beings, but one who is uncreated and unlimited. Almighty is the Father, Almighty is the Son, Almighty is the Spirit. And yet there are not three almighty beings, but one who is almighty. Thus the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. And yet there are not three gods, but one God. Thus the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, the Holy Spirit is Lord. And yet there are not three lords, but one Lord. As Christian truth compels us so to acknowledge each distinct person as God and Lord, so Catholic religion forbids us to say that there are three gods or lords. The Father was neither made nor created nor begotten. The Son was neither made nor created, but alone begotten of the Father. And the Spirit was neither made nor created, but is proceeding from the Father and the Son. Thus there is one Father, not three fathers, one Son, not three sons, one Holy Spirit, not three spirits. And in this Trinity, no one is before or after greater or less than the other. But all three persons are in themselves co-eternal and co-equal. 
And so we must worship the Trinity in unity and the one God in three persons. Whoever wants to be saved should think thus about the Trinity. It is necessary for eternal salvation that one also faithfully believes that our Lord Jesus Christ became flesh. For this is the true faith that we believe and confess, that our Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son, is both God and man. He is God, begotten before all worlds from the being of the Father, and he is man, born in the world from the being of his mother, existing fully as God and fully as man, with a rational soul and a human body, equal to the Father in divinity, subordinate to the Father in humanity. Although he is God and man, he is not divided, but is one Christ. He is united because God has taken humanity into himself. He does not transform deity into humanity. He is completely one in the unity of his person, without confusing his natures. For as the rational soul and body are one person, so the one Christ is God and man. He suffered death for our salvation. He descended into hell and rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. At his coming all people shall rise bodily to give an account of their own deeds. Those who have done good will enter eternal life. Those who have done evil will enter eternal fire. This, this is the Catholic faith. faith. One cannot be saved without believing it firmly and faithfully. Amen. We pray for Christ's Holy Church, for the nations of the world, and for the needs of our brothers and sisters throughout creation. For Christ's Holy Church, that we might be a place where the gospel is preached purely and the sacraments administered rightly, so that all may encounter the living God in this world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all bishops, pastors, deacons, seminarians, teachers, and parents, that the Spirit might give them faithful wisdom, so that by their efforts those in their care may better know the works and deeds of God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those in positions of authority, that they would live as servants of all and work with diligence and understanding toward the good of all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For students, teachers, and graduates, that this academic year might wrap up well and that they might use their new knowledge and skill sets for the good of others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the grace to know God truthfully, that we might be given the strength, patience, and humility to hear who God has declared himself to be, so that as we gather in worship, we gather around a God who is real, true, and full of life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For an appreciation of the mystery of God, that we might give thanks for the revelation of the Trinity, and that we might rejoice in the incomprehensibility of the fullness of God, that we might love and know our God, and that we might be in awe of his unfathomable majesty and splendor. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who are poor, homeless, or forgotten, that they might know the good will of God, and that the people of Christ might act to share gifts of compassion and care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who are ill or battling limitation, that the Holy Spirit might renew their bodies and refresh their spirits, and that people of encouragement and assistance might bring them into their care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all who have died, that they might be at peace in the presence of Christ, and that we who grieve might find hope in the works and promises of God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who have lost their lives in the service of our country, that by their efforts, others might find a better life, and that we all might have a greater awareness of the blessings we enjoy that have been shared with us through the hands of others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercies through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Come in. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Take a moment to share that peace.
and merciful. You bring forth food from the earth and nourish your whole creation. Turn our hearts toward those who hunger in any way, that all may know your care. And prepare us now to feast on the bread of life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you. Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, you reveal your glory as the glory of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, eternal in majesty, undivided in splendor, one Lord, one God, ever to be adored in your eternal glory. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Merciful God, you are most holy and great is the majesty of your glory. You so loved the world that you gave your only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. We give you thanks for his coming into the world, to fulfill for us your holy will, and to accomplish all things for our salvation. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. his salutary command, his life-giving passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and the promise of his coming again. We give thanks to you, O Lord God Almighty, not as we ought, but as we are able, and we ask you mercifully to accept our praise and thanksgiving, and with your word and Holy Spirit, to bless us, your servants, and these your own gifts of bread and wine, so that we and all who share in the body and blood of Christ may be filled with heavenly blessing and grace, and receiving the forgiveness of sin we may be formed to live as your holy people and be given our inheritance with all of your saints. For to you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory in your holy church, now and forever. Your kingdom come, your will be. 
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace unto everlasting life.
get I get out in the field. Um, good morning, everyone. It is a joy to be together on this Trinity Sunday. Just a few announcements before we depart. The church office will be closed tomorrow on Memorial Day. Um, community dinner will be served by the by Trinity this Tuesday. Um, please check the sign-up board down in Trinity Hall for all kinds of opportunities for this summer, including a hike next weekend. And if you have any phone numbers of the people coming to Late Church, be sure to text them and let them know they got to be here a little earlier today. Are there any other announcements for the good, for the good of the community? Thanks be to God.